how's it going? And we are here with John Masari. How you cheers. doing? Cheers. 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 All the way here in La- Las Vegas, beautiful northwest Las uh-huh. Vegas. Uh-huh. Oh wow. And northwest this, Vegas. And the libation that we are consuming is Whistle Pig. Whistle pig whiskey. <laughs> yes. How's it going? Mm, it's going well. Hold on a second. I'm going to take a sip here. Test that out. You go ahead and, uh... That is very good. Right? Smooth. That's the, uh, that's the only, this is the first one we found that we really, really like. So right. we came into this knowing absolutely nothing about whiskey. Yeah. And, right. um, <clears throat> the first couple of, uh, batches we had were whew, pretty bad. Well, we, we signed up for like a, it was like a whiskey, like a subscription online and they send you like every three months, they send you a bottle. And right. this was like, I think this was like the second one we got or the third one we got. The third. And we were like, oh, this is, this is it. This is all, all we need. Everything else was burning uncontrollably. <laughs> and this one we drank it and I was like, oh, so that's how these guys do it. Right. So now you just still your own. Yep. Yep. That's yep. it. We got a, I didn't show you the garage yet. <laughs> but anyways, everybody out there listening, um, this man is well known for um, these creepy, these creepy little dudes that come from outer space. And you did all of the composing on killer clowns from outer space. Here we go, guys. We're getting a shot over here. <laughs> here we go. I need to give me one of those t-shirts. I know that is a really cool uh, shirt. That's uh, cavity colors. It's cavity, cavity colors. colors? Yeah. Okay. They they have a really great artist that uh, does uh, awesome interpretations. There's a variety of them, and this is this is one of my favorites. Yeah, okay, that's really nice. cool. Yeah, my so, wife is terrified of clowns, so I, I, <laughs> I when I told her that you were coming on the podcast, she's like, "What what is that?" I was like, "You know that movie that you hate, Killer Clowns from Outer Space." Right. She's like, "He's not coming in a clown costume, is he?" <laughs> it's like, he, no, he no. wasn't one of the clowns. He was the composer. No, no. Uh, I had my. Um, nephew tony called me he was like seven he says uncle johnny mom won't let me watch killer clowns from outer space because she says it might be too scary <laughs> and i said well tony i don't think it's too scary i think it's just too weird yeah she says i have to be 13 to watch it that's what it says on the <laughs> pg 13 and so he uh, so one time he called me i think he was 11 he goes Uncle Johnny, I saw Keller Clan. <laughs> I go, does your mom know? She goes, yeah, we saw it together. <laughs> and they watch an old school VHS. Ooh. Oh, wow. That's so uh, Every impressive. now and then he got that nice little across the screen. That's That'd be the only way to watch it if you're going to watch it for your first yeah. time. Yeah. I tell you, when, when I when I saw it originally in uh, at the Egyptian Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, um, it, it looked... I'm, I'm, I was used to watching movies in a movie theater mm-hmm. right so now set the way back machine to move forward 30 some odd years later at the egyptian they had a screening and um it was a cinematic void run by uh jim branscombe out in hollywood and he puts on the most great shows now during covid he's doing uh, uh drive-in theaters oh, okay. okay okay yeah it's really awesome so I, I was with my wife and a bunch of people said, I haven't seen this in 30 some odd years mm-hmm. on film. I've only seen it on, you know, digital. Mm-hmm. And and I after working on the movie, I probably saw it four times, maybe at the uh-huh. most. And not even all the way through. Yeah. Just like parts of it. If it show, if it you flip in channels and it shows up on some mm-hmm. cable network, watch two minutes of it or something. But when you see it back on film, there's something about the magic of real film through a projector. Uh-huh. The tw- 24 frames a second. Absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's not, a, I don't want to say it's a flicker rate, but it's like the <clears throat> camera, the, the images are resonating at a particular uh, frequency uh-huh. uh, within time that it, um, it it's a different experience mm-hmm. to see it on a big screen. And then there was like, it was a fairly large theater. It was like 600 people. It mm-hmm. was full. We did a Q- Q- Q&A. This is like about a year before I put my concert on. Okay. And uh, when we did the concert, we we uh, used the original um, negative mm-hmm. that was transferred digitally. Oh, you did? Yeah. We didn't use the new one. That, uh, that uh, There was one that... Uh, it was remastered, right? 
Right. Uh, so the one we saw was a digitized version of the Kyoto Brothers timing. Because the Kyoto Brothers, they timed the negative. They helped adjust the colors properly. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <clears throat> they were really thrilled about that, 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 that we had the original for our concert. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, That's really a, cool. How uh, how old? So how old were you when you did when you composed everything for Killer Clowns? I don't think I like that question. <laughs> <laughs> how long ago was it? Hold on a second. I have to do a water <laughs> water chaser. <laughs> Hold and ask the wrong question. He's like, well, guys, I'm going to go catch that flight now. <laughs> I was um, 29. Okay. And um, going on 30. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, uh, you know, anything you do in the media industry, there's like 100 stories for every mm -hmm. job that you work on. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's not like, uh, you know, I, I got my... Uh, um, I got my uh, documentation to be a composer and I applied for a job at Universal Studios. It, do it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Right. So I was, uh, I had a friend, a very good friend of mine uh, was a producer and I was doing a lot of uh, productions with him prior to Killer Clowns. And um, at one point, um, things kind of didn't go well for him and we were uh we were roommates for a while and while he was planning his next move writing his next scripts doing research at the library <laughs> <laughs> not on google going to the library and looking stuff up yeah. knowing the dewey decimal system to uh, you know going through the index cards doing his research um so he came across uh one of the trade magazines the variety he came one day back from the library uh, the piece of paper says there's someone looking for a composer to do a trailer okay now this guy's name was eric young who uh, was doing commercials out in um, uh, washington dc and he did a trailer for his horror movie and and back then you had to get a cassette together and put it in the mail send it to him and two weeks later he says oh i gotta have you work on my trailer so he came out to la to record it and then he this Eric Young started working for Disney and then he called me and he says, I know these guys that I used to work with back East. They, uh, they're really awesome. Uh, they're working on their first feature. It's a sci-fi. I think it's a science fiction, but it's really weird. You may not be interested in it. And I go, well, what's, what's, why wouldn't I be interested? Cause it's like killer clowns invade space or attack of the killer clown or something like that. I go, I gotta see this. Yeah, I this is something I've been waiting for all my life. <laughs> so I met the Kyoto Brothers, and we had a screening. And there's probably about you know a hundred people at the screening. Most of them were composers. Okay, and we all had to do a demo. So as we left, there was like a little little bag with a like a note, some notes, like a uh, <clears throat> a synopsis of the mm -hmm. movie. Yeah, plus a VHS tape with you know just production sound mm -hmm. i'm i'm 99 sure that the dickies song was placed in it already okay and when i saw that i go okay this is gonna be good this like sets the tone for the movie it's perfect um um uh, uh, leonard phillips wrote the song and the lyrics are just fantastic mm -hmm. my favorite lyric from the song is uh there's cotton candy everywhere says the polka dotted man with a stock of jacaranda isn't that, isn't that poetic that yeah. is very poetic <laughs> yeah yes. yeah he's yeah it's quite quite a uh, quite a, a very literate uh, well-read individual but in any event I, I took that home and i picked one scene i saw the movie like what i do i i still do this with quick time i'll watch the movie in real time uh -huh. then i'll watch it fast forward like scanning through i'll scan backwards and I'll scan it again, backwards and forwards. Okay. And I kind of like know the movie. It like hmm. sits with me. Okay. And I had a, a cool VHS that I can go through an hour and 20 minute movie within like 15 minutes or less. Wow. You so know. you would watch it, you'd play it forward and backwards at like a high high speed. Yeah. After I've watched it in real time. <clears throat> so okay. you'd watch it normal and then you. Yeah. And kind of taking some notes like of the storyline because mm -hmm. it's important to know like the cadence of the movie itself. Okay. You know, like, like, and then all of a sudden, 
<clears throat> subliminally, at least in my mind, there are certain scenes that stick out. So the scene that I picked to do my audition mm -hmm. was the scene where uh, Mike and Debbie come up to the uh, the uh, the tent, the circus mm -hmm. tent in the forest, mm -hmm. okay. which I think is the most gorgeous scene. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you first see that um, <clears throat> scene of the the spaceship slash circus tent in the middle of the desert. So <clears throat> it was at that point I said, "This is my Keystone moment." Mm -hmm. Basically, they come into the tent they meet the killer clowns yeah they get chased out there's that famous line where it says why are they doing why why clown you know why cotton no why popcorn yeah they're why popcorn yeah. because they're clowns is what <laughs> because, you know and the the dog the the balloon yeah that oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh my gosh that's like i mean i just completely cracked up so um <laughs> and then what do we have after that they drive off they run over a killer clown and they slowly rise and they march. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toward mm -hmm. the town. That's our movie. That part gave me the nightmares movie, as a the kid. <laughs> basically, if you had to watch one scene mm -hmm. in the movie, that kind of like you know what you're going to get yep. into mm -hmm. after yep, that exactly. scene. And what's really great, it's basically in the. Uh, it's all, I think it's in the first reel going into the second reel. It's the perfect place. Mm -hmm. in, in other yeah. words, no one has to wait like you know. 25 minutes into the film for the first gag yeah, yeah. you know they get to see this thing it's okay i'm in for the ride now so i um I, I just know the kyoto brothers in one of my meetings with them prior to writing the music is that they they liked particular movies uh there's uh, king kong okay. mighty, mighty joe young Okay. Uh, all the Ray Harry has housing movies with all the special effects in them. Wow. <clears throat> Basically, what they all have in common musically is they have like very legitimate scores that's they're it's based in classical repertory. So, which I'm very familiar with. So mm -hmm. that's how I approached it. I figured mm -hmm. the music is going to be the straight man of the film, and um, so they. I got a call like maybe a week after I did the demo with synthesizers, just like, and I didn't even think that it didn't even sound that it wasn't really polished yet. Mm -hmm. And, but they understood the concept of where the music was going. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So I got the call from Steve Coyote says, okay, you're the guy, uh, you know, we got to get this thing started. So that was, was that your first movie then? Well, uh, I think it was my first movie on my own. Okay. Okay. And I had done little movies. Like I had done this movie, The Wizard of Speed and Time. Okay. About a year, actually three years before that took um, quite a while to finish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't been released yet. So I, that was one of my first movies. And um, there was lots of television that I worked on. I worked on episodic television. I, I worked on, there was a TV series. Uh, you seen you did some stuff for uh, HBO. HBO, yeah. There was mm -hmm. the Ray Bradbury Theater, and uh, that was one of my first series where I did the theme music. And every season, I would do a variation of the theme music. Okay, that's cool. Then there was uh, there was Little House in the Prairie. Yeah, okay. I was like okay. I was like an assistant composer. I was kind of like a, a, you know the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> And then there was, um, I, I worked uh, on, there was a t another TV series called Heart to Heart. I did a few of those. Okay. And, and a variety of things for the Disney Channel. Okay. There was a variety of the, the, uh, uh, commercials, promos, trailers, and things like that. So, uh, and then there was my friend's trailer that, you know, he he, he developed it into something else. He, he did a different feature than the one he did for a trailer. But a oh, okay. friend of mine. So... Uh, I had a pretty good, I put in a number of hours, flight yeah, time, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, at, at the craft. And uh, so, so this was something that was just ripe for me to work on at that time. Hmm. That's, That's awesome. pretty cool. That's very cool. Because you were saying, we were talking earlier and you were saying something about, a, was it a crisis, right? There was a crisis. Or a crisis. Is it something? Oh, a band that I was in called Crisis. Yeah. Well, during high school. There we go. One of the one of the <laughs> we're going to get the nitty gritty. <laughs> the lead guitar player um, made a comment on YouTube. Hey, how come you don't talk about your days playing with Crisis? <laughs> I go, well, I have. 
but in their their own ver- variety of podcasts. Yeah. It says, well, why don't you send me a link and all that? Like, I'm going to go through and find, <laughs> okay, this is the link. Go at 23 minutes and 15 seconds. And so I'm going to start it off here and he's going to have to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways. When we um, edit, we'll find the time and we'll just let you right. know. Yeah. So the Killer Clown March, I actually wrote when I was in high school. And uh, the band that we were in, we did what was called, before it was called heavy metal, we did hard rock. Okay. Right? Okay. So we played Kiss. We played um, uh, Led Zeppelin. Okay. Black Sabbath. Nice. Um, you know, and, and we we're going to start to kind of branch out and do our own songs. Yeah. Right. Uh, by the way, I should say we always got, uh, depending on where we played, we couldn't play Sympathy, Sympathy, uh, Sympathy, Sympathy for the Devil. You couldn't by, by uh, Rolling Stones. Yeah, did, did they not let you or no? They said because it had sympathy for the devil. They thought that oh was horrible. So that, yeah, that, that that era that was probably yeah. just too yeah. like if we played a quinceanera or, or <laughs> yeah. some church gig. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't understand. You what? Know. No stairway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So uh, stairway heaven. That's okay. You can play that four <laughs> times. Yeah. So, anyways, so I wrote that Killer Clown March like back then. And when I played it for them, they just thought it was too jazzy. And they just started goofing on it. Okay. So, so so when I did the, um, when I saw that scene in Killer Clowns, I thought, that's where it's going to go. Oh. I, re- I know exactly what to do for that. Wow. That, I'll just haul that out of mothballs and it'll be just, just fine. So did you? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. That's one thing they, they really liked. The, the music director who later became, um, music his name is bob hunka he's the one that picked the dickies okay okay you have to understand by the way let's talk about the dickies for a second they're like the ramones yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. they were like a, a established signed uh punk band at the time <clears throat> we so were... f- for him to score that that was really awesome so he heard that march and he said that's it you've defined it that march it's got that it's got this angular uh, uh, motif to it that just like that's all that's what you think you think of killer clowns when you hear that so uh and he said that not me wow i just thought it would work and so he's he uh and he loved it he solidified it yeah wow that's amazing it definitely uh it definitely worked there yeah it was a lot of fun <laughs> it was a lot of, it was i was glad and what i'm really what's really thrilling to me is that uh people enjoy it but I, I feel like I have inherited a, a family of, of nieces and nephews uh, throughout the world. The journey. That, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that uh, From all over the world, from Brazil, from Europe, that contact me. They're, they're musicians and uh, people coming up in the business, you know, ask me for advice and what have you. That's amazing. And I'm blessed f- because of that, for mm-hmm. because of this movie. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, what ha- if you don't mind me asking, what happened to your band? What ended up happening with you guys? Well, it's a high school band. I mean, we played <laughs> high stick- school dances and stuff like didn't that. Didn't stick around much yeah, longer. Yeah, we all, we all went. You know, there was there was Doug, Doug, Joe, and John. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and uh, now Joe, who those, was, those who, are some traditional names right yeah. there. <laughs> right, right. There was Doug the drummer and Doug the lead guitar player and singer, and then there was uh, um, Joe, uh, who was the uh, the uh, bass player and rhythm guitar player, and I was the keyboard player and bass player. Okay. When it when depending on what song we were playing, now Joe he still plays guitar. He was a a, a roofer. He became a oh, you know, wow. a roofer had a roofing business, and uh, he lives in Long Beach, California. And he says he wakes up every day for like two hours. He has a room like a, his tool a tool shed that's just full of really great awesome, awesome awesome amps that if you oh. i mean they're like vintage amps yeah that when we bought them they were that's the amps that you mm-hmm. would buy but yeah this was like it, and he says I'll, I'll just make myself some coffee and play for two hours wow every day. and i heard him play man and i says we got to do something you know yeah. we did write some other songs he doesn't give you a hard time about your jazz still does he no, no, he thinks it's cool. He's when I came to his house to hang out with him and jam. He said, uh, "Oh, by the way, my wife and uh, my uh, my grandkids are watching your movie." And then the, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, and I says, well, "That's okay. I don't want to interrupt him." But uh, you're like the you, the part you said was too jazzy when I showed it to you. <laughs> oh, I to, I told him the story and he laughed. He says, "I don't remember." <laughs> That's awesome, man. Like, hey, remember when you guys made fun of this song? <laughs> Yeah, that oh, it's, it's not like that. <laughs> Even today, I mean, I mean, I I do a lot of um, work in the uh, 
advertising business. Uh huh. Okay. And so everything's subjective. You know? Yeah. You you just do your best work, and sometimes it works for them, and sometimes it's like eh, I'm not feeling it. What's well, what like? <clears throat> I mean, when you were doing this, like I bet you never. Looking back at it now, is it kind of crazy, like how big it's become? Like how much of a staple it's become of that era? Well, here, I had a lot of faith in the movie. Okay. We're talking about Killer Clowns. I had a lot of faith. I had a lot of faith in the movie because at the time, Tim Burton had done um, Beetlejuice. Uh Okay. And I thought, this is a, this is like a new genre of Beetlejuice, of crazy stuff. And then there's um, Richard Elfman, who's Danny Elfman's brother okay who's a director he directed this awesome cult film called uh, the forbidden zone that when i saw it i saw it about two years before killer clowns i i just i want to i want to work on these kind of films so bizarre where you have to like stay with the film to figure yeah. it out mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um and so i saw that killer clowns from outer space is that and i thought it was just gonna like be a nice cult classic very much like chucky okay okay very much like um uh leprechaun and what have mm-hmm. you and i think what happened is we got lost in a little crack and we killed brothers i constantly talk about this that uh back then there was no social media yep. so no like inst- no instant buzz mm-hmm. like people taking selfies and video of themselves yep. i'm at this guys you gotta see this crazy yeah, movie. yeah. you know there's nothing like that so I had a friend that I went to college with that worked for the LA Weekly. He was the the movie critic and uh, music critic. He went and saw it, and unbeknownst to me, and he wrote a beautiful review. And then uh, Chuck Serino, who's also a filmmaker, he did the sound design for Killer Clowns from Outer Space. One of his pals at the LA Times saw it, and he gave it a nice review. Okay. So when it finally got published... People come to the theater. Hi, I, I thought the Killer Clowns movie was supposed to be here. Oh no, it's gone. You it know, because it was only there for like a week and a half yeah. or two weeks. Man. And so just about the time that you know it gets the attention of someone that mm-hmm. can publish it, that people can read, mm-hmm. physically read. Yep, like yep. read mm-hmm. and get mm-hmm. down there. There's a lapse of like three weeks. So by know? the time it got out, it right. was already right. And there was no pre like for instance like for Star Wars. Star Wars was so smart. I was in I was at UCLA at the time of Star Wars, and every day, um, at at dinner time in the in the in the cafeterias of the dorm, someone would set up this um, a projector, and you'd see this trailer for this movie, and we'd all say, "Hey, where's the trailer for that movie? That weird space movie? We mm-hmm. want to see it." And it's like we never knew when it was going to come out, and when okay. we heard it, we heard it was going to come out in summer. Uh-huh. So this was the plan of 20th Century Fox. And I'm sure George Lucas said, you go to all the college to you pay them this trailer. And this is the trailer that had the weird music on it, the weird synth music on it. Okay. 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 So it was like really dark and bizarre. Yeah. And so when I saw it in the movie theater and it had obviously a very different score, yeah. like a very operatic, you know, it was, <laughs> it was quoting and- everything from the, from the, 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 the repertoire, the classical repertory. And, um, uh, there was like Vog- it was like a Wagnerian opera, uh-huh. basically from a music standpoint, and um, we uh, just loved that movie. So that was super smart marketing. Mm-hmm. If that had just been released cold, it might have taken a longer time, maybe a maybe a few more weeks to come as popular because they did have a, a big release. On yeah, it. yeah. Killer mm-hmm. Clowns had regional releases. Okay, it was like at one time it was like like all of. Uh, Southern California, then Northern California, up into Seattle. Then it went the Midwest. Then it went to oh, okay. side. So okay. it, it like jumped. Okay, so, so it didn't release everywhere at once. Yes, exactly. So uh, people in St. Louis was, aren't reading the LA Times. Was that mm-hmm. common back then? Mm-hmm. Okay, for a movie to release like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And you got to understand, it wasn't from um, a, a bigger studio. Did not. In other words, Paramount didn't distribute it. Mm-hmm. Or uh, right now, it's owned by MGM. Okay. Right? Okay. So um, MGM has run with uh, you know the various uh, permutations of uh, new video releases and repackaging. Uh, there are other people that do that that license it from 
MGM is my okay. understanding. And also the, you know, t-shirts and stuff like that. Okay. So everything, yeah, because everything now is kind of owned by somebody and then it's just a bunch of little subs. Yeah. Companies yeah. that yeah. help push it. And- well, that's how you, like, that's how you get movies like The Nun, mm-hmm. you know, that come out and it's like, it gets all of a sudden people, people can identify it sooner mm-hmm. because of social media and the word yeah. spreads from there, you know. I still like, yeah, even like with all that though, like cause it, we were in the studio last night and yeah. I was like, I was like, oh, our man. band, yeah. Yeah, I was like, John Masari is coming on the podcast and I was like really excited. This was a last minute podcast for all of our listeners out mm-hmm. there. Uh, we lucked out, but uh, <laughs> we got. And I haven't heard music from your band and I want to. <laughs> We'll have to do that before you go. Yeah, we could <laughs> we could show you some stuff. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah. So no, I told him like as soon as I said that, like there was a, they had one of the guys in there. He does artwork and stuff, and he's like, he was like Killer Clouds, and he started naming off stuff. And then I was like, oh yeah. And then my sing our guitar player's like, dude, I got this and I got that, and like, oh my god, what time's he gonna be there? And I'm like, I was like, well, okay, well that's good. I guess as many people know about Killer Clowns as I do. <laughs> he came uh, today, actually, our guitar player. He came to drop off the. Toy he wants you to sign for him. <laughs> oh, I've got to do that. I, yeah, got, yeah. I got some stuff for you guys to sign. Yes, should, I, definitely. should I show your, your Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see what we yeah, got. Yeah. Your you audience. He brought us some gifts, guys. You know, okay, we love gifts. Hand me. I got them not one, <laughs> but two original soundtrack albums. That's so cool. That's amazing, dude. This is one this is one with me uh with an orchestra playing the uh, Oh wow. Playing oh, the okay. I have heard that yet. Selected selections. Then my next thing. It's yeah, not I can send them here. Not one, but two. These are um, these are the uh, posters for the uh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed that. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is all pre. This is all pre-written. Let me see if the next one is. What do you know? Anyways, so this is this is a, a mini poster of the poster f- that was in the lobby for the concert. That's for you guys. I'll sign that for you. Awesome. Too. And this is a piece of artwork uh, where um, <clears throat> Stephen Kyoto he oversaw the details on this, and then an artist in uh, Madrid. That's such a cool picture. Oh wow! Um, uh, his name is Javier uh, Burgos Gascos. He did that, and then my little suggestions. You know, so this is like a, a original thing. This what, was what the, were your suggestions? You don't mind me asking. Oh gosh, all sorts <laughs> of stuff. But you know what? I I, I forgot. All I know is that Steve Kiero's suggestions were better. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for instance, I wanted the orchestra to be set here playing uh-huh. with, okay. with Killer Clowns conducting. He goes, no, nope. the the Killer Clowns came and turned him into cotton candy. So it's cotton candy. Yeah. The oh, musical instruments. I saw that. I was like, that's really cool how yeah, they yeah. did that. So, um, no, this was a um, like a 12 by 12 foot by 11 foot um, a mural. Oh, wow. That was a, cool. on front of the uh, on the front of the theater. OK. So okay. when we had the um, the audience, uh, you know, waiting in line, this is what they pat. This is what they would. Oh, that's so cool. See. And it's kind of like a where's Waldo kind of thing where it's a lot of uh, details in here. You can really study it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It just keeps on going. Really. You can just keep looking at it and find something new on it. And, and then I have one, not awesome. two, because it's very, very, very limited. This is a, uh, a very interesting little cult film. Uh, that has a very, very small but very loyal audience. It's called The Wizard of Speed and Time. And we made a vinyl release for all these special people that love this little crazy film. So, I have, I'm going to watch. I haven't seen it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. It, you can you can see it on YouTube for free. Okay, can people cool. still buy the vinyl? Uh, the vinyl? Yeah, they contact me. Okay. I, I sell it on eBay. We'll have all of his links down below. Yeah. Dude, that is, this so is awesome. Cool. This is so awesome. Thank I you so much. You're friends, welcome. Friends, no, no, friends. thank you for yes. having me. That is so cool. So, <clears throat> you got it? Yeah. The CDs, these, man. I just want these I love to get CDs. Up, so. <laughs> so, when you, uh, what got you into, this is a question, but what got you into doing that? Like, what, like, music? When did you start music? What was, what was, was it just passion driven? Was it spur? Was it? Well, uh, it started when I was a kid. Okay. And I always loved music. You, uh, I had a radio by my bed, a little AM radio that I would listen to music all night. Uh, everything. I would okay. just listen to everything. I just love music because it gave me an experience. Okay. Um, and uh, a variety of experiences. So uh, I remember creating musical instruments. For instance, I would get a, um, 
a, a, like a piece of wood or a shoebox a ruler mm -hmm. and string rubber bands across it pretend i was playing guitar oh wow anything that's awesome you know, uh my mom she got a piano and she wanted to study piano and she it wasn't for her and so you couldn't turn me away from the piano wow. this is when i was around five right okay so uh we never really had a musical instrument in the house until i was around five and a half six years old so ar around that time i went to a uh, triple feature at the local theater and it was uh the time machine mysterious island and journey to the center of the earth oh wow oh, wow and those movies just like captivated me mm -hmm. i just couldn't take my eyes on so i found out a little bit later that the experience that, that what made those movies so dear to me was the music score uh -huh. so uh, i would start tinkering at the piano more and more and i took piano lessons and I think it was when I, I was like 10 or 11, I said, I want to be, I didn't even know what to call it. I said, I want to be a music writer. And my parents said, what in the world is that? What do you mean a music writer? <laughs> well, you know, you watch a TV show or remember P P Planet of the Apes, all that really crazy <laughs> yeah, music. Yeah. I want to do that kind of stuff, you know? So it really wasn't understood. Even to this day, people don't realize what you do. What? yeah mm -hmm. really you know and i go yeah everything you see and hear uh there's music that's licensed for that's created for just the purpose of just music that gets licensed to you be used in commercials and the movies and the trailers all sorts of stuff it's a whole industry it's kind of yeah. like real estate almost yeah yeah you know where it's leased and resold and sold that's how people you know earn their living so um so that's what kicked it off it was that triple feature that's amazing. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. And then from there, you just kind of, did it, did it click? Did you have to do lessons or was you just Well, it, it was hard to find, as a kid, it was hard to find, I even the people I studied, like trumpet from, uh, piano from, and other instruments, and I used, used to play bass, um, they didn't really understand it. They heard about it, but they mm -hmm. didn't really know much about it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I started going to, um, like, honor band, and I would meet an arranger. Mm -hmm. that had worked on a movie or worked on a TV show. And I started asking him, him about it. You know, I started learning more and more about it. So there, there wasn't like the internet to go through or YouTube tutorials or anything like that. So I had to like discover, yeah. make discoveries. So when I was in college, I also studied privately with uh, someone who was an orchestrator okay. Okay. who worked on, he, he was when I met him, he was like 70 years old and I was like 20 something. He had worked on all kinds of stuff throughout his life. So uh, he, he was also some of his pupils were um, uh, James Newton Howard. Oh, wow. So and, and a f uh, several other people that, you know, have wow. pr pretty, pretty, really awesome careers. So he not only showed you how to, to do uh, music format it properly he also uh, introduced me to other composers to like apprentice with them okay so it was like kind of like that thing like mm -hmm. so when you called some composer to ask if they need help in any way any way shape or form yeah 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 even like little tiny things not to like write episodes for him mm -hmm. um you mentioned this guy's name his name is albert harris he said well i'm a student of albert harris he, they go okay so you you it, you've gone through the two years with him so you know what you're doing okay but that doesn't mean he's gonna you're gonna be all of a sudden you're gonna get a screen credit yeah 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 <laughs> you know you may kind do, of a foot in the door yeah you did menial things as a matter of fact there was a time i came to david rose that was little house in the prairie that i had um dirt under my nails and he goes uh he goes what were you doing he says oh i was changing my oil in my car you know how to use tools? Yeah, I, I do my own tune-ups and everything. He goes, come on in the back. And so he had, uh, David Rose had a, a hobby of st miniature steam engines. Oh, wow. What? So so there was times, you know, here, help me. I need you to help me tear apart this gearbox. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And so he played records that, from a horrible record player that had all kinds of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, oil on it and things like that. We listen to classical music, oh, just, like crank what? and turn stuff apart. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that was cool. I I think that was more fun than <laughs> <laughs> working on his show because he he goes crazy. Imagine working on the same thing all the time, and yeah. he would say that it's, it's the same thing. Got We got to find out a way to make it interesting so we don't go crazy. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. See, so you have to keep keep yourselves entertained pretty much in some sort of way. Right, and that was his that was his uh, 
quiet time away from doing something completely different. It had nothing to do with music. And know? they just he just kept that all set up like in the back, pretty much like where he had access to it whenever he needed. He a break. had like a hangar in his wow. backyard and wow. a garage and a repair and a machine shop. I mean, it was you know he had all the really cool old stuff stuff to fix steam engines with. That's awesome. <laughs> and he had a track that went in his ba- huge backyard in uh, Studio City, California. And then a huge front yard went around and uh, every once in a while he'd have grandkids over and he would fire that up. That's you know? so cool. I never saw any of them fired up. I would just help. Uh, just help worked on them. Yeah, help. You know, he would get parts you know, you know, from among collectors. He would mm-hmm. get parts that have to be, because you take this part apart, we only need this central gear, mm-hmm. whatever, to go in that engine, you know. That's so cool. Yeah, it was really So you awesome. have some uh, experience with miniature steam engines yeah <laughs> sort of it's like don't call me don't hire me to build that for <laughs> right you, i'm but. not i'm not at that, i'm not at that, i'm not at that stage <laughs> that's awesome that's like that's some of the little things you know you'd never actually hear about though until you actually talk to somebody that yeah knows somebody so mm-hmm. i think it was, was that was like a big walt disney was into that stuff too right steam oh yeah yeah, yeah and one of his animators um I, I forgot his name, but one of his animators that was uh, very famous, he was one of the original seven okay, animators, okay. was really into actually full-size steam engines. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Ward Kimball was his name. Okay, okay. I met him once. I got to meet him once. Really? Yeah, yeah. So working for, when did you start doing stuff for Disney? Well, it was because of this film, Wonder, uh, Wizard of Speed and Time. Okay. This, uh, the, that... Uh, that album you saw, that um, I got in, a foot in the door, so to speak. And um, I worked with Mike when he did a few things for the Disney company. And then afterwards, I got asked to come back, hmm. you know, to uh, to do various things. And I worked my way up to doing the Wonderful World of Disney theme over a period of like eight years. Uh, yeah, about eight, eight and a half years. So you did the Wonderful World of Disney theme? Yeah. And from time to time, I still do Disney things. <laughs> Although I'm not aware of it, because oh. I, I I create music for um, a variety of uh, well, one in particular production music companies that that music gets licensed. That's what you were saying. They kind of it's like real estate. They'll right. sell it off. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's why if you look me up on IMDb, I have a a wide variety of things that have my uh, my music in. Mm-hmm. You know that I don't necessarily write it specifically for them but they Uh think that whatever i did works for this scene you know whether it's yeah it's like thinking music or a sad scene um or something goofy so all your stuff is just out there and they kind of hear it and yeah pick through it and what they oh that's that's awesome right so so yeah so like then i guess so i guess i never knew it worked like that so you don't actually just write things always specifically for a movie sometimes you'll, yeah oh yeah a lot of times yes you'll just done, do i did i did a uh, movie not too long ago called um uh, cruel hearts and uh, that was a you know a movie that like uh, we need scary music here okay we need suspenseful music here that kind of thing so is that what you write en- something brand new do you okay. en- is that what you enjoy most is doing like the horror stuff um, I I love all of it. Okay. I did a I did a western, a full out traditional western, really, really? called uh, War Path. Oh and, wow! Uh, with a, a director um, Josh Becker, and he's of the uh, clan of filmmakers from uh, f- from uh, Sam Raimi. He he's worked with Sam Raimi a okay. lot, and that was just a plain old western. Huh. So I had to do like western, like from. Like old westerns. How know? was that? Was that was that pretty oh, fun? Oh, that was a. When, been dying to do a western. Uh, when, did you, when did you do that? Uh, that was last year. Oh, so oh, it was really awesome. recent. Yeah, re- re- very recent. How many how many instruments do you play? Well, uh, how many instruments do I play? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I do play the piano or and keyboard instruments. Uh, Is that I, would uh, you say that's your main? Yeah, but I wouldn't hire myself out. I've played trumpet and French horn. And the bass, the contrabass, okay. and the electric okay. bass. I have a few basses, and I do like to play bass. Mm-hmm. I like it better when I hire someone to play bass. Uh, but it's fun for me to play bass on certain things. I guess. Yeah, we were watching the on YouTube your video you did when you did the uh, Killer Clowns mm-hmm. with the band. Right, right. Yeah, we've seen you playing bass. That we, was that we, was really cool. We basically, everyone did their parts separately. We. we we, was that during the pandemic or no that was a while ago and really I said, and i said wouldn't it be cool if you just go in there and 
play the part again along with the track. And we'll stick a video. That together, was awesome. You know, that's awesome. And basically, in real life, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of re recreated that's so cool. that. So that it wasn't a live session that was done remotely. Really? Okay. No, wasn't. That's cool though. It looked. We just like kind great. of re kind of re recreated. Well, you okay. had us fold. I thought it was a live. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, isn't that cool? Yeah, well, that like was. It, it kind of works out, huh? and it kind of worked out with the uh, all the pan. If you watch it, you know, after the pandemic and everything, because you guys weren't together. So. It looks like it looks like a pandemic kind of. Yeah, thing. <laughs> you guys were ahead of ahead of your time, ahead of the curve there on that right, one. Right. Yeah, John was sorry. Came up with that first, guys. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, um. Great, I lost what I was talking about now. So instruments. Uh, so when instruments. You, yeah, when you do this, so so then you don't always play all the instruments. You you find people to play with you. Do you have set people you use? Well, there's. A, I always like to change it up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and sometimes what's a lot of fun to do is to set yourself some boundaries. Okay. I mean, I've got like so many plugins, so many instruments, so many. But I say if I just keep this set of instruments that I'm going to, that's going to make, and I like be very um disciplined in that respect i can be more creative because mm -hmm. i can find creative ways to use those fewer instruments right okay and then uh there are some times where it's like oh it's got to be we have to have everything in this you know everything every, you know like a big big production and what's interesting is like the bigger production the more it becomes like a big color Okay. like a big wash okay. uh -huh. whereas if you have just like five instruments that's another thing because like everyone has their own lane to play in you know mm -hmm. very defined mm -hmm. uh, boundaries and you can it's a really great listening experience and you really uh music has a different definition than if you have a big orchestra yeah where like you know like you have a giant woodwind section of 18 woodwinds start mm -hmm. you know in the very very like 60 piece string section maybe like 20 uh, 50, 15 20 brass players uh -huh. um and uh you know a, a, a big percussion section it becomes a big wash of sound even though there's like details like mm -hmm. if you like sometimes if you play the isolated tracks you go wow the wood you can listen to the woodwinds all by themselves they mm -hmm. sound really cool but when they all play together and they're balanced out that's one experience mm -hmm. you know and there's a certain um uh um skill you have to have as a composer and orchestrator to figure out what what the, what's the piccolo going to be doing okay you know what i'm saying or why am i using piccolo what role okay. does it play you know every, every voice of the orchestra has has their own um they, they play off of each other mm -hmm. there's a symbiosis and that's all little details yeah and it takes a lot of a lot of um listening to like music of that nature a lot of listening i still listen to it th to this day like during this pandemic i've been studying um bruckner because it's kind of like passed me by you know i did okay. i go you know i never really looked at closely at bruckner and so i would listen to a lot of bruckner and then there's a youtube channel that has his original manuscript that they go page by page as you're listening to the music oh wow oh, that's awesome and it really opens up uh what is going through his mind when you see what he scratched out and what he fit in the okay. margins and stuff like that. So it's literally like his actual. It's actually his, you know, it's actually in his hand, oh, you know, wow. not a published score. And so you get a real insight. You go, wow, he took out three measures. And I, wow. can't, and I can't even see what's in there because he X'd them out. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Like, that's so yeah. cool. That's very cool. And uh, and some of these, these are these are long symphonies. Some of them are over an hour long, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, I tell people to get really discouraged that you know so, oh people didn't like what i did like let me tell you a story anton bruckner he was in his 60s he wrote his sixth symphony he never heard it it was never performed he rehearsed a few of the movements never it just sat there and you know what he did he wrote three more symphonies <laughs> that is wow. insane kept moving on as a matter of fact there's a story where he was rehearsing one section and he wanted the orchestra to play it. now this is where you didn't have you couldn't put a recording device on so you can listen to you have to go by your memory the experience yeah, of listening uh -huh. to it for the first time and he asked them can we can we play the section one more time and they said no we, we gotta go you know this is you know they're just an, it, it cost a lot of money just to for him to rehearse it to, see, to see, if okay. he wanted, yeah. see if he wanted to change it now it's part of the repertory yeah now it's like everyone plays it but that fact you know it's really sad that back then when he originally wrote it people could care less mm -hmm. you know? so like 
stuff like you'd never be able to hear those originals like that original we're talking like 1880s yeah wow That's just I mean the very very early days there's some recordings original recordings of bronze Brahms on wax uh -huh. and you could barely hear him play because it was like I mean the technology was yeah. fully uh -huh. developed I mean you can have someone say hello hello you know yeah but as far as getting the the nuance of a piano performance it just can't hear couldn't it. really pick it up yeah you won't you wouldn't be able to get a decent recording to maybe like maybe 1912 somewhere okay. around there. Okay. I can't give you the exact time, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's the early the 1900s. Date. But the, yeah, the you know early 20th century, you started getting uh, uh, recordings that you can actually listen to. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess yeah. I, I don't know. I guess maybe start really thinking about that. You never really like how much stuff that was actually. You don't. You never got to hear. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know, of these guys trying to figure stuff out. Yeah, it could have been amazing. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, but that's all just gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when like, you think well, about except it. for your book, you might be able to recreate it, right? Right. In your mind, you know, you can he listen to the score and go back and remember what it sounded like. But you never heard the actual recording. Imagine that is it's so like living crazy. in a prison. <laughs> yeah. So when you do, uh, so you start off a small piece. You've done some orchestra stuff, though, right? Oh, lots of So that. do you yeah. do, do you arrange all that or do you kind of sit down with somebody that? Okay. There are times where I come up with the, uh, the theme and the, uh, concept for the orchestration. Okay. Um, uh, for instance, for Killer Clowns from Outer Space, when we did the, or when we, it's the entire score is now orchestrated for orchestra, right? So what I did is I had my sketches that were for synthesizer made into like a piano score. Okay. And I started like um, uh, assign, you know, orchestrating it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get it in time ready for, the concert itself, it was going to be too much. I, I myself couldn't do it. So I, cause I was concentrating on other aspects of, of producing the show. Mm -hmm. So I had a very good uh, orchestrator. He lives in uh, Austria, um, in Vienna, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and he, um, his name is Bernhard Eder. And he took these piano scores and I just basically made notes on them. Woodwood's doing this, Woodwood's doing that. And then he would orchestrate, send it back. And I'd say, you know, we maybe we could put more here or less there. And then he would have suggestions. I go, well, I was thinking of doing this. And, it, you know, it all came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was all very wonderful. The synth score is a, a very much hints at what the orchestration is supposed to be. So we have that at least. So uh, he, he was able to do that. Now, there are times where I do all the orchestration. If I have the time to do it, okay. Uh, sometimes, uh, if if I have if the budget is so that I have to do just about everything, it can take a score for a feature that has, you know, an hour's worth of music in it, can take like four months. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah, easily, you know. And then there's the then there's the trick. Once you get the part written and everything's fine and approved, it's a big word, improve, approve. <laughs> <laughs> Then there's the mixing aspect, uh -huh. which which I have over the years uh, gotten great advice by real engineers and uh, get like lots of tips about innovation because you basically with samples, for instance, you have to learn how to create um, a variety of, of acoustic space uh -huh. so that the samples don't sound like just a recording of the strings. It sounds like this, those strings are actually playing in a room and they're coming from here, oh. like over there. So when yeah. you close your eyes and listen, you can visualize the orchestra placed in front of you. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's just not just the recording of the mic close to the string section yeah it's the mics that are above the conductor and all the overheads yeah and the... And it's the mics that are like way back that are getting some uh, reflections okay of of whatever space that you're in mm -hmm. Jeez. so i never knew that much went into it no <laughs> yeah and that's just, just so it sounds realistic it has mm -hmm. some breath to it otherwise it starts sounding like this big synthesizer and this is when you're recording it all right you say this is well this is after you record it okay yeah and then i i do a thing where uh there's uh there's musicians in europe that will have a, a really fine string quartet okay this is for strings that they'll play uh they'll play the music mm -hmm. and that will go into it that will lend another dimension and also brass players 
brass player and woodwind players. I'll say, you know, can you play this part and this part, and send them the part that record it at their home, and they'll give back to me. I'll put it in the track, and then the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the matrix of acoustics it, mm-hmm. that signal will go through that, and then create the originals, and it all blend. I always try to if so, other people are recording. Uh, if everyone's recording independently, I just say get the mic as close as possible. Nice dry sound because everyone's going to go into the same consistent yeah. uh, acoustic space. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm just curious. Like <laughs> we're nerding so out here, is, guys. I'm yeah, sorry. We're geeking out. Please, <laughs> please, please excuse the geek. <laughs> Everybody, any of our music listeners are going to be like, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just curious. Like for like obviously us in a normal like rock band, you know what I mean? Right. It takes us a month to record a song hey, get that, it done completely how yeah. long how long does it take to do something to record like fully 100 percent something like an orchestra um it depends how, how long the piece is if you're like if you're working you on get it, one like, shot well i mean i've done pieces that are you know four or five minutes long they've spent a good uh, six weeks wow working on it wow because it's just like constantly details and details and then depending on what i'm what i'm doing there's like other layers I like to put on that are not orchestral, mm-hmm. I call them like deep colors, where I may take the entire track of the mixed orchestra and put it through like a, uh, a synthesizer sequencer. Okay. That will only, uh, once you put it through it, it like filters out certain frequencies and allows things to play at certain rhythms. You ever see those? It goes yeah, across. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, they call it a sequencer. So I, I might play with the timings and what frequencies get accentuated, and it builds a rhythm track. Hmm, that that's sounds super cool. That sounds different than the orchestra. And then I'll do kind of crazy things where I'll record it onto audio cassette. Oh, wow. And throw and mess with the azimuth adjustment on, uh-huh. the, on the cassette deck and then throw it back into the digital domain and maybe put that through a variety of delays and reverbs wow. and see what happens to where it's almost unrecognizable, where it's like it picked out a certain frequency and it made this really nice chord. Uh huh. You know, and yeah. I go, well, maybe I can just cut everything out, cut the orchestra out at this point, have that weirdness play for two measures and then bring everyone back Mm -hmm, in. mm -hmm. But those two measures were created by the orchestra. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) That's awesome. It's it's just basically playing with all the stuff you got. That's That's amazing. I mean, that's just one way. I just gave out a secret there that I should, you know, send you guys a bill for. (laughs) (laughs) But it's it's not a secret. Everyone does that. Everyone screws around. But I think that's something that you get. um, That's not something that they're going to. No, it's more. I'm only allowed one shot a month. Okay. Other than that, you know, horns grow. Up. <laughs> other, than that, other than that, him and the band gets back together. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. It's like feeding the gram- gremlins after midnight. <laughs> right. It's just a matter of, fig- you know, you, you want to do something. You want to do something to your music that cuts you from the herd. And it's not easy because you may do something. Like, wow, that's, that is just the shit. Mm-hmm. That sounds awesome. And other people go. <laughs> what I was, what I was getting ready to say is, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that comes from because of how long you've been doing it too, because mm-hmm. you understand how older technologies work, right? And mm-hmm. how recordings changed and progressed over the years. Mm-hmm. Which is, I don't, I personally don't think that it's for the better. Mm-hmm. Always, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I think it's for the better for smaller bands like us and stuff. We can go record a song in somebody's, you know, bedroom. Mm-hmm. And it sounds good. Sounds yeah. great. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, because the music is good too. Mm-hmm. That's the part. You know, your your the concept of your music has got to be great. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can you can have the best equipment in the world, and if you don't have something to say, it's it's not going to get communicated. But as like as opposed to like these guys now, like trying to do something or create something different, like what you were just saying, mm-hmm. they would never think that, or never really, you know, they're not going to search that on YouTube to learn yeah. how to do that because right. that's just that's not. It's not a standard industry standard anymore, I guess. Well, you could. I mean, there's a million ways. I mean, mm-hmm. there's guys talking about exactly what I'm talking about, and, and I, I I pick up tips from that. I go, well, that sounds good. I think I'll do that with mm-hmm. a with a different spin on it. You know, um, I did a, a collection of Christmas music that I do have a YouTube video out that I did, and you'll hear like these little wacky rhythmic things, like you know, I don't, I can't, I can't do it. The, track does it better than I but <laughs> all that was you know pals of mine says where what's that from what patch is that from I go that's the track played through 
stuff oh. to create a different thing. Oh, wow. And maybe it plays in a certain sequence, and I go, wait a minute, these two beats here and these two beats there, and that one beat here, let's stick those together. Oh, good, we have something new mm -hmm. that that plays mm -hmm. a, like a rhythm track behind it, you know. I think that yeah, that's that's so wild. I I, I feel I feel like, <laughs> but that's what you do. I'm after. just I'm just yeah. after you've come up. With I'm on the, cloud nine right now. Af, yeah. <laughs> after you do the track that like works, mm -hmm, then, okay. Mm -hmm. I want to add that extra little bit of something that's gonna um, add a little magic to it. Mm -hmm. Which is you know? which is awesome because I feel like now like you know, like nowadays there's like the younger guys you know that are, that record stuff and they don't. They don't want to put the time into it to do cool stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They'd rather go find a preset for it, and right. it's already there. Well, so. yeah, you could do that. Which but, works, yeah, you, but... You could find something that works for I feel like I feel like creative-wise, that's just that's amazing. You, you end up buying too much stuff, mm -hmm. in my opinion. The industry is getting kind of lazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. You end, up, you end up buying a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, mean, I admit, I bought it. I bought something last week that I just thought was the coolest thing. <laughs> it was, um, I can't tell you the, the I, I don't remember the name of the um, software developer, but it's basically a talkback mic. Okay. That you press the button and you're going to talk to the band, right? And the band's playing and what comes in, so you got to tell the band to sh shut up, guys, don't play. I'm talking to the drummer so you can hear. <laughs> but when the band plays, it sounds like a complete mess. Yeah. Right? But, uh, but it's like, the most awesome, distorted, you know, overblown, saturated sound you can get. And you can play with it a little bit. Oh, and I actually used it on something. It was just, it was great. It's just exactly what awesome. I need. But it's so simple. It's the simple electronics of the talkback mic uh -huh. that they, that they uh, model. So just to get like the, so you to get those crazy sounds. Right. You to, use the talkback mic. Me, it's that, it's that really heavy duty, um, that really heavy duty, um, saturated uh compression okay you know, where everything's just squashed and just almost like lo-fied yeah it's lo ultra lo-fi too okay. but you can control it a little bit okay, okay. and certain instruments sound different uh, that's depending so cool. on how you use it you know that's so cool i'd be interested in hearing something but from i that. loved it because it was so simple <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is the easiest thing it has, it has no presets it, and you just mess with the knobs and yeah. that's like that's kind of what i'm talking about like something like that mm -hmm. guys don't think about that nowadays right. you know what i mean right. they wouldn't think to use something like right. that to get some crazy kind of sound you know everybody now kind of focuses on is cleaner is better yeah so i'm but and I that's, think, that's awesome well it depends i mean clean is cool mm -hmm. you know when you when you want that yeah you know um, but, um, you know, when something has to be, has some rust on it. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. So we get on a, we're going to change, change speed a little bit. We get on a lot of topics around here about, uh, movies changing now. Um, how do you feel? How do you feel like, uh, I guess the, the film style and everything is going. Do you think that it's better? I, I, we're just saying like, I don't think you can really like, uh, like when you see like killer clowns from outer space, mm -hmm. you know what era it's from. Mm hmm. I don't know if it's. I feel like we're losing all of that. No. Like I feel like there's nothing you, that really stands out about new movies. You won't know till twenty years from now <laughs> about the films today. You just won't. Touche. You know? Well, I mean, like if you think about twenty years ago from two thousands, there's really right. nothing that I remember that I'm like, oh my god, like you know, that's Back to the Future. Right. It's yeah. Not I a see what you mean. Like a seminal like yeah. movie that like. Uh, well, you know, one thing I think. Uh, one thing I could think about. It's 1999, actually is uh blair witch okay that okay. like it's like a documentary uh -huh. style yeah, it was, yeah that was a good one and no one knew you could do something like that uh -huh. that was a little that was like the first one that actually just took handheld like the cameras. handheld yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's like um you know there's this you saw a certain awkwardness in it at the mm -hmm. film but mm -hmm. yet it was still scary mm -hmm. you know uh and there were sometimes you were wondering oh gosh wait a minute there's wait a minute there's someone filming all this <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's another POV over here that shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, um, but you're so immersed in it, you don't even really catch that unless you take a step back. Right, <laughs> you're like, wait, I shouldn't be seeing that guy. Yeah, and I feel, I feel like the like the Borat movies was interesting because it was kind of like that. Uh -huh. Okay, it, uh -huh. I mean, some of it is set up, but it's set up so well, it sound it feels so awkward and cringeworthy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh -huh. there's that. You know, and of course, uh, he he does all sorts. Man, Sasha Borat. Baron Cohen is such a good actor. He he did this series where he was a um, Israeli spy in Syria, 
I haven't seen oh, that. scary! It's an edge your seat, and I forgot really? the name of it. I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's either it was Netflix or Hulu. It's a it's a, hor- a horror movie. Or? Oh, it's not a horror movie. It's a you know political thriller. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Spy okay. Spy movie. Okay. You know? But as far as horror, I mean, um, let me see. I I, I I've seen, but it's a series, Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I saw a movie that um, I really liked. That was a horror movie. It was shot in the Netherlands. And it was about a bunch of people hiking, hiking through a forest and they come across this, um, uh, like a village of people that have to like give a sacrifice to some crazy woodland creature oh, wow. that can only live in the forest. If like you could pass right by the forest, it can't survive. It was like terrifying. Is this a movie or? It's a movie. Movie? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Huh. It, yeah. It was really, it, it was really awesome. Okay. Here's a movie that I really like. It's like cheap thrills. <laughs> Um, Iron Sky. Iron Sky. The whole concept of Iron Sky. Well, the concept of Iron Sky is Nazis made it to the moon, and they live on the dark side of the moon. And nobody knows. And no one knows, and they're planning a reinvasion of the Earth to, you know, okay, take over, this. Take over this. the world. Oh, my gosh. When was this? When was this? When it's, did this come it's, out? Okay. It's like science fiction, Nazis. It's, it's tongue-in-cheek. Also, a bit tongue in cheek, and it's got great special effects. Okay, and it's just bizarre. I mean, you have basically Panzer tanks have been converted into flying saucers. What? <laughs> what? And they look like Panzer tanks. No still. way. Oh yeah, you, it, I gotta see this. Oh yeah, when I I, I I forgot how I ran across a trailer on YouTube. I go, this this is my kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bizarre. What's it called? Iron Sky. Iron Sky. And, I want to remember and that. They didn't make one of them. Uh, they didn't make two of them. Uh-oh. They made three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you thought the first one was crazy, they get worse. They really? get crazier. Yeah. So they yeah. just keep on, I keep on, them. just keep and on. Then, going. And then they threw in what I am always missing. You got flying. I'm always missing in movies is if you had a flying saucer. You've got some kind of weird, like uh, what I call diesel punk, which is like uh, not steampunk. Diesel punk is like World War II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then flying saucers and dinosaurs. Good. Yeah. And dinosaurs, dinosaurs. So in the third one, they they add the dinosaurs. Oh, of course, you can't. Third one, you got to get extreme. It's so it's so bizarre. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, this this sounds amazing. Yeah, you got to check it out. You guys would probably, I bet you guys can do a great um, like when you uh, uh, like, like um, a viewing. What do we call it when you do reaction? Like a reaction, rea- reaction movie. Okay, yeah, yeah. We, we that'd just, be awesome. Yeah. We just launched a reaction channel, so now we're gonna put that on the yeah. list. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, because we're always talking, and like I'm a huge fan of, we're both huge fans of '80s movies and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And uh, uh, that's what we, we on on our podcast. I mean, just him and I. I was t- we were talking about like The Breakfast Club, The Outsiders, stuff right. like that. Mm-hmm. There's not movies now that stand out like that. I feel like mm-hmm. in you know 2018, 19, mm-hmm. 20, mm-hmm. and I, think I don't just, know. I feel we just like keep saying like this era is like uh, we were talking with one of our guests, and he said this like. He thinks it's the era is not distinguishable. Yeah. Hmm. That's how that's how he kind of feels about it. He's like, you know, when you hear 80s, he's like, you see somebody from the 80s, the way they're dressed, you know that movie's right. that era, the right. 70s, the 60s. Mm-hmm. Right, right. You know, the 90s. Is, and he's like, you know, I think that the 90s was like the last distinguishable era. Hmm. And I was like, I, I could agree with that to a point. Because yeah. like nowadays, movies, even as far as like... A, Cause I've always been a big fan of scores and movies and stuff like that. And like, I'll, I'll listen to, I'll watch a movie and I base it off of camera angles and how they filmed it and the film style. And then like the scores. And that's what I remember. I never remember a movie by the scene. I remember by like that sound, the, the, like the score Mm -hmm. that was going on, what you were feeling, the emotion, the camera angles. Yeah. And that's what I think like nowadays we're losing that. And Mm -hmm. it's almost like they're kind of just shortcutting. And just making mm-hmm. movies, I guess. I don't well, know. Well, you know, I have an interesting observation. It's a little bit of a subject change, but uh, I remember one of my favorite sci fi movies is Forbidden Planet. Okay. okay. And so that was like, I think it was made in 1957. And even by today's standards, you know, they did a really great job mm-hmm. with effects, story. Um, the color is just immensely vibrant in that, in that um, movie. And you didn't really get another good sci-fi that was like respectable until 20, more than ten years ago, two thousand one, in Space Odyssey. Okay. And everything else was like, too goofy. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It's like too goofy. And it's like that's what I love about Stanley Kubrick when he does horror, like The Shining. It's like opera. It's like 
absolutely mm -hmm. terrifying. It reaches in your gut and pulls it out, whereas um, other horror is considered to be just silly. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I got to be honest with you. When I saw Friday the 13th, I thought, oh, okay, this looks like it was shot on old film or something like that. It, yeah. it, was, it was seemed grainy or things, like, but that's what people loved. Oh, yeah. about like the, it. the thrashers. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's what people loved about it. To this uh -huh. day, it's like, People are just, they just love that genre. They, as a matter of fact, they prefer to watch it on VHS. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think that. <clears throat> 2001 was uh, George Lucas, right? No, 2001 was Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Okay. Yeah. I, thought, yeah. I think George Lucas, I thought he had something, something on that. Oh, he had a TX. Um, he had a movie that he did. It, it was like a. Around a, that time, a, right? A dystopian future. Yes. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I forgot. T TX1128. Yeah, or yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, even know about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. and, and he had done. Um, Before Star Wars. He had done a shorter version when he was in college at film school. Mm -hmm. And then he blew it out to a feature. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? And then he did. Um, he did a 50s thing. Um, uh, a movies with the 50s theme to it that had. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, crap. What's that? Something nice. Graffiti or something yeah, like American that? Yeah, American Graffiti. Mer American yeah. Graffiti, yeah. And it had some of the cast that showed up in Star Wars. Yes. Oh. Uh, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford was in it. I think Carrie Fisher, yeah, right? Carrie yeah, Carrie Fisher was in it. Yeah. yeah. Lucas did that? Mm -hmm. Wow. You guys are blowing my mind right now. <laughs> just, yeah. just, I don't pay attention to the. I just watch I just love the Star Wars movies. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought George Lucas was just Star Wars. I didn't know he did anything else. <laughs> I'm like, what? He goes to the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> He's a real person? That is awesome. <laughs> No, man, that's uh, it's so cool just hearing about like all the music and stuff and everything like that. And mm -hmm. I can't believe you've been doing this since you were five. Well, <laughs> wanting to. I had to learn how to do it <laughs> just bit by bit. You know? Well, that, we just found out Dan he, Sperry started his own magic show when he was 12. So yeah. that's pretty cool, too. Is that the guy you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was telling us about that. We were cracking These up. These are his uh, cards right here, actually. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and did he do uh, some of his magic here? In your oh, he did. With those cards. Yeah. I, you <laughs> know I'll timestamp it and send you the clip. Yeah. I'd love to see it. I, you know what? I, what I love about magic, especially closed magic, I love not knowing how it's done. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like the fact that, wow, he figured that out. I'm not, yeah. awesome. not going to lie. I was, I was so blown away by it that we got five cameras running. And I broke down every camera trying to figure it out, and I still couldn't. Yeah, no it's, idea. It's a lot of skill. It's a, I I kind of equate it to like someone who's like a really great violinist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like wow, that's that's like magic to get to that level of skill where you can play like that takes takes such um, um, commitment, you know, and yeah. craft. Yeah. You know, the, definitely your job is on. It's not to figure it out. It's just to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and be, I get people that are you get people that are like, oh, they're obsessed. They with need to know. It. Yeah, yeah. It is. It takes a lot of skill. It is an illusion. Mm -hmm. It's something that takes me many, many years how to do. I mean, and it's an I've, art. <laughs> I've seen some close hand. Uh, there was a guy that won some um, award in Switzerland for uh, they call it close in magic or something like that. Okay. Yeah, where, where you have to be close. It's not like you're doing a big thing. Okay, okay. And he did a thing where uh, he had a warm box of freshly purchased Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, come in the box. Okay. And then he's having a conversation, and all of a sudden you hear peeping, and he opens up, there's little chicks in it. What? Yeah. Wow. I, I don't know how he did it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he did it. I clapped. <laughs> That's you know? awesome, man. That's yeah. so cool. And the whole yeah. time he's doing it, he's like, there was this sound right here. <laughs> We're in I could just just give me give me give me give me two weeks. I'll get you some sound for that. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> we were in, uh, we were in Disneyland better. like last year and there was a guy there doing magic. Just ran, I think some random guy yeah. right. just came up and he's like, you guys want to see some magic? We're like, absolutely. We yeah. thought he was one of their performers, but no, right, he was just right. some guy and he was, he did some pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Street performers are the best. Yeah. But, well, man. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. That, I told you, you lose, we, we've already, uh, we're about an hour and 15 minutes. So wow. That's fine. I you, just have, wanna, you have plenty to cut with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to. I know you gotta, you gotta get back to yeah. where you're from. Get yeah. back to your side of uh, the crazy world we live right, in right now. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so awesome. By the way, this country out here is so beautiful. Thank you. It's so great. We like where we live. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> they were, we were driving him over here, and he's there like, "What side of Vegas is this?" Yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't this, feel like you're in Vegas. This is Las Vegas. Now, uh, when you edit your shows, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let me know, and so I'll. Oh yeah! Promote the crap out of it. Awesome, yeah, no, awesome. absolutely. We'll get all that. We'll uh... and let me sign those for you. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Can I take this off now? Yeah, that's okay. fine.
We're gonna we're gonna just finish this out. We'll roll a little bit longer and we do this. Okay. And then we'll do uh all right, everybody, and uh, we just got done signing everything. John brought us some really cool gifts. Um, you guys are going to see these on the amazing. back wall in the studio. Amazing. Um, I want to say thank you so much for Absolutely. coming down and hanging out with us. Thank you for having me, guys. Um, Absolutely. Really appreciate it. It was a real, it was a lot of fun, and it was a real honor meeting you. So, Absolutely uh, thank you. an honor. Well, thank you, and, and um, you live in some beautiful country. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so, you. So uh, let's do a uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers. That's it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. See you guys.